So today I feel like talking about functional anatomy and components of the masticatory apparatus, their characteristics and relationship. Examination of orthopedic diseases and the history of the disease and the rules of its management. So first of all, we need to talk about the theories of maxillofacial growth. Uh, first of them is the genetic theory. It states that all growth is controlled by the programmed influence of genes. Uh, the next theory is the removal theory. Uh, it states that the growth of the craniofacial skeleton is carried out due to bone reconstruction. What is reconstruction or removal? It is a selective opposition and resorption of bone on its surface. So the third theory, it's the sutural theory. It claims that the sutures primarily determine the growth of the bones of the craniofacial skeleton. The forces of expansion of the seams lead to the expansion of the bones, which in turn encouraged the growth of craniofacial skeleton. The fourth theory is the, the cartilaginous theory. It claims that the cartilage determines the growth of the craniofacial skeleton. Cartilages are responsible for growth and bone only replaces them. So, and the functional matrix theory. We use this theory in our practice. It claims that the origin, form, location, growth and maintenance of all bone tissues is always secondary to compensation and the need to respond to chronological and morphological previous events or processes that occur in specifically related non-bone tissues, bodies or functional spaces. As you could see on the picture, heterocephalus is proof of the functional matrix theory. So in this theory, there are two main types of growth movement. First of them, it's the remodeling, changing the size of each bone, successfully moving a component of the whole bone, given the shape of the bone according to its function, fitting the bones to each other. And displacement. Displacement is physical movement of an entire bone at the moment when apposition and resorption take place in it. So on this picture, you can see the process of remodeling and the process of displacement. So you need to understand that uh, in the bone, uh, it, uh, it is a process of remodeling and the whole bones uh, make the process of displacement. Displacement is a physical movement on an entire bone at the moment when apposition and resorption take place in it. On this picture, you could see the uh, fields of resorption. They are black color. Uh, we call them the negative fields. If you uh, will give a force on these fields, uh, the bone will resorb. And the uh, fields of displacement, they are white color. So, here you can see a simplified diagram of the growth of the lower jaw. Growth directions that include periosteal resorption are indicated by arrows that enter the bone. And growth directions that include periosteal apposition are indicated by arrows that exit the bone. Uh, it is not uh, correct to say that the lower jaw just grow. The lower jaw doesn't just grow. It remodels and moves down and forward. So a few words about the anatomy of the lower jaw. The lower jaw is an unpaired bone consisting of a body, a cellular part and two branches. Each branch rises in our pants with two appendages. The front one is coronal and the back one is condylar. The upper part of the condylar process is called the head of the lower jaw. The mandibular notch is located between the processes. The body of the lower jaw in its shape resembles a tubular bone. Inside it uh, lies the mandibular canal, which contains a vascular nerve bundle. 
The mandibular canal opens on the inner surface of the jaw into the mandibular opening or foramen mandibular and on the outside near the chin opening. It's foramen mentalia. The body of the lower jaw passes into the alveolar process, having two bony ridges on the sides, one of which runs along the outer surface and is called the external oblique line, and the other is located at this level, only on the inner side, called the maxillohyoid line. The maxillohyoid line is the place of the attachment of the maxillohyoid muscle. External and internal oblique lines serve to strengthen the lower molars and protect them from loosening during transverse chewing movements. The external and internal oblique lines are the limit of atrophy of the alveolar process in the case of tooth loss. Near the corner of the lower jaw on the outer and inner surface, there are sharply expressed roughnesses that serve uh, for the attachment of the masticatory muscles. The masticatory tuberosity or tuberositas masseterica for the attachment of the masticatory muscle and the pterygoid tuberosity. Tuberositas pterygoida for the attachment of the internal pterygoid muscle. So, a few words about nasal maxillary complex. Horizontal lengthening of the bony arch of the upper jaw occurs due to remodeling of the maxillary tuberosity. So, here you can see the process on this picture of the remodeling of this complex. Remodeling the nasal maxillary complex in the frontal plane. During remodeling, bone resorption occurs in negative field areas. They marked with a minus sign, while bone apposition occurs in positive fields areas. They marked with a plus sign. So here you can see the processes of the remodeling. So the nasal maxillary complex grows from down, from up to down. Uh, anatomy of the upper jaw. The upper jaw is a paired bone, each half of which consists of a body and four processes frontal, maxillary, alveolar, and palatine. Frontal and maxillary processes connect the body of the jaw with the same names bones of the facial skull. The alveolar processes of both halves of the upper jaw form the maxillary arch. The palatine processes of both halves of the upper jaw being connected by a sagittal seam participate in the formation of the hard palate. Atrophy on the upper jaw, in contrast to the lower, is limited to the alveolar process, rarely moving to the body of the jaw. Contraforces of the upper jaw. Uh, there are four central forces. Maxillary transverse upper, it's yellow color. The maxillary transversal lower, it's orange color. The middle control force of the upper jaw is but with red color and the lateral maxilla with blue color. Uh, on, this, on this picture you can see also the control forces of the lower jaw. Uh, they are the upper control force, uh, it's marked with brown and the lower control force. It's marked with green color. In areas where the tension uh, from the chewing pressure is high, the bone thickens, forming control forces. All chewing pressure, which is uh, perceived by the dental arch, is transmitted by control forces. Muscles. Uh, Masseter muscle or musculus masseter. The superficial part of the muscle starts from the outer surface of the zygomatic bone and the from two thirds of the zygomatic arch. The deep part begins from the back third of the lower edge and the entire inner surface of the zygomatic arch. The muscle is attached to the masticatory tubercle of the branch of the lower jaw.
temporal muscle or musculus temporalis. Starts from the frontal scale, the scaly part of the temporal bone, the large vein of the sphenoid bone. Bundles of fibers of the temporal muscle converge into one powerful cord, which turns into a tendon, which passing under the zygomatic arch is attached to the coronal process of the lower jaw. Medial pterygate muscle or musculus pterygoidus medialis. It starts from the pterygoid fossa and the medial plate of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. On the picture, you can see it, uh, it is marked with the green color. It is attached to the pterygoidal tubercle of the angle on the lower jaw. Lateral pterygoid muscle or musculus pterygoidus lateralis. The upper head <coughs> starts from the subtemporal head and the subtemporal crest of the large vein of the pterygoid bone. The muscle bundles of both heads converge and are attached to the front surface of the neck of the lower jaw. The joint capsule and the joint disc of the temporal mandibular joint. Maxillohyoid muscle or musculus miliohyoidus. The bundles starts uh, from the maxillohyoid line, go inward and backward, and form a seam along the medial line with the bundles of the opposite side. Digastric muscle or musculus digastric. Muscle bundles of the anterior abdomen begin in the bigastric fossa of the lower jaw, go backwards and outwards to the heated bone. The posterior abdomen begins from the mastoid notch of the temporal bone, passes forward and downwards, passing into a tendon that connects it with the anterior abdomen. The guineohyoid muscle or musculus guineohyoidus. It starts from the chin bone of the lower jaw, which is located above the maxillohyoid muscle and is attached to the body of the hyoid bone. Actions of masticatory muscles. Musculus masseter, it raises the lower jaw, moves it forward, and moves it to its side. Musculus temporalis. It raises the lower jaw, pulls it back, and moves it to the opposite side. Musculus pedigridus internus. It raises the lower jaw, moves it forward, and moves it to the opposite side. Musculus pedigridus externus. It moves the lower jaw forward, takes it down in the opposite direction. Musculus digastricus. The lower, the lower jaw pulls it back and leads it to the opposite side. Musculus genioglossus. Pulls the lower jaw back, lifts it up. And the latest musculus genioglossus lowers the lower jaw and moves it back. Mimic muscles. The mimic muscles are involved in grasping, holding, eating, and making sounds. They play an important role in the act of sucking and eating liquid food. Uh, on the left side, you can see the mimic muscles. Uh, the laughing muscles or mus musculus risorius, muscle that leads the upper lip or musculus levator labi superioris, muscle that lowers the lower lip, depressor the labi inferioris, the large zygomatic muscle, musculus zygomaticus major, muscle that raises the corner of the mouth, levator anguli cordis, muscle that lowers the corner of the mouth, depressor anguli cordis, and orbicularis cordis muscle, or musculus orbicularis cordis. Two words about the temporomandibular joint, or TMG. It is a paired combined joint 
formed by the hands of the coronary processes of the lower jaw, the mandibular fossa, and the articular tubercles of the temporal bones. Uh, most often, the head of the lower jaw is elliptical, elongated in the transverse direction. However, there are other variations of morphological architecture. And you can see that the type A uh, it is 25%. Uh, the most frequently you could see is the type B. It is 60%. Type C, 12%, and the type D is only 3%. Uh, okay. The variations of the morphological architecture of the head of the lower jaw in the axial plane. Uh, it is marked in blue color. So the most frequent is the, uh, is the picture A. Is the front surface is flat, the back is convex. It is 44%. Uh, on the picture B, it is a big convex or convex on two sides, 28%. Picture C, the front surface is concave and the back is convex, 22%. And picture D, it is flat, only 5%. And picture E, it's big concave, uh, only 3%. The articular surface of the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone is two, three times greater than the articular surface of the head. Fibrous cartilage covers only its frontal part, which is located in front of the petrosus, tympanic cleft of the temporal bone. Capsulage covers the articular tubercle as well. So here you can see the mandibular fossa the articular disc is shown with red color. Uh, we would also see the cerebral cavity. Uh, they are the upper cavity and the lower cavity and the condyle of the lower jaw. The front part of the mandibular fossa and the tubercle are surrounded by the articular capsule, which has the shape of a cone with the base at the top. The front edge of the base of the articular capsule is located in front of the articular tubercle. The back reach the stony tympanic cleft. The capsule on the condylar process is attached in front along the edge of the head of the lower jaw behind 0.5 cm below its rear edge. Oh, here you can see the fibrous carp capsule is green color, the lateral ligament is red. The joint cavity contains an articular disc, or discus articularis, made of fibrous cartilaginous tissue similar to a beacon cave lens. It divides the joint cavity into two floors isolated from each other. The articular disc can move along the articular tubercle due to the fact that the articular capsule at the level of the lower floor of the joint cavity is stronger and better stretched. And the tendon fibers of the lateral trigoid muscle are woven into the anterior medial edge of the articular disc. So here you can see the condyle about this condyle with the red color, the, the fibrous covering, and the disc. You can see also the articular fossa. The sphenomandibular ligament or ligamentum sphenomandibulare stretch with the thin fibrous cord from the spine of the sphenoid bone to the tongue of the lower jaw delays its lateral and vertical movements. The stilo mandibular ligament or ligamentum stilo mandibular is stretched between the steloid process of the temporal bone and the inner surface of the back edge of the branch of the lower jaw. It inhibits the forward extension of the lower jaw. So on this picture, you can see the spinal mandibular ligament down with the yellow color the stilomandibular ligament with a red collar and the capsular ligament. 
Uh, ligament apparatus of GMG consists uh, of wedge mandibular ligament, ligament of mandibular of stylus mandibular ligament, or ligament of stylo mandibular, and lateral ligament. Movements of the lower jaw in TMG. They are the rotation. You could see it on the picture A. Uh, yeah, While well, opening and closing. On the picture B, it is the body movement. Uh, it can be a protrusion or protrusion of the jaw. On the picture C, it is the chewing movements in the left TMG. And on the picture of the D, it's the chewing movement in the right. TMG. Uh, during the chewing, you can see uh, that there are two sides, uh, the working side and the balance side. And due to these chewing movements, you can uh, also see the Bennett angle. Sagittal movements of the lower jaw. Forward movements of the lower jaw are carried out by bilateral contraction of the lateral trigeoid muscles. Fixed on one side in the pits of the trigeoid processes, on the other on the front surface of the head of the lower jaw by the articular disc. The forward movement of the lower jaw can be divided into two phases. In the first phase, the disc together with the head of the lower jaw slides along the surface of the articular tubercle. In the second phase, the sliding of the head is joined by its hinged movement around its own transverse axis. The distance traveled by the head of the mandibular during forward movement of the mandibular is called the sagittal articular path. The sagittal joint path is characterized by the angle of the sagittal joint path. This angle is formed by crossing the line, lying on the continuation of the sagittal joint path with the occlusal or prosthetic plane. The transverse movement of the lower jaw. Lateral movements of the lower jaw occur as a result of contraction of the obturicate muscle on one side. During the movement of the lower of the jaw to the left, the right lateral triggered muscle contracts. In this case, the head on one side rotates around its axis, which goes almost vertically down through the branch of the lower jaw. At the same time, the head from the other side together with the discs slides along the surface of the articular tubercle. If the lower jaw moves, for example, to the right, then on the left side his head moves down and forward, and on the right side it rotates around the vertical axis. The head of the lower jaw on the side where the muscle has shortened moves down forward and slightly inward. At the same time, cross the path at an angle to the sagittal line of the articular path. This angle was first described by Bennett and it is equal to 17 degrees. Chewing mechanism. The chewing mechanism is a set of mechanical processes that lead to grinding and grinding of food in the oral cavity. The act of chewing consists of biting off, rending, and crushing food. Mechanical processing of food in the oral cavity is carried out with the help of teeth, which together with the lower jaw perform a complex cycle of movements. Uh, Dr. Gizzi presented the uh, cyclical, the cyclical movements of the lower jaw in the form of a diagram, which you could see below. So on the picture A is the position uh, of the central occlusion. On the picture B is the lower jaw is lowered and moved to the side. On the picture C, you can see the lateral occlusion. And on the picture D is the position of the central occlusion. The initial movement 
uh, I'm sorry, and the initial moment of move movement is the position of the central ridge in jaw. Then four phrases follow one after the other continuously. In the first phase, the jaw drops and moves forward. In the second phase, the jaw shifts to the side. In the third phase, the teeth are closed on the working inside with the same tubercles and on the opposite side with the different tubercles. In the fourth phase, the teeth return to the position of the central ratio of the jaws and the chewing cycle is repeated again. After chewing, the jaw returns to its position physiologically rest. The act of swallowing. The oral cavity is closed by the circular muscle of the mouth. The jaws are compressed by the masticatory muscles and the lower jaw becomes a fixed point in relation to the hyoid bone. The muscles of the floor of the mouth begin to work, including the muscles that lower the lower jaw, which tighten the hyoid bone and thus the back of the tongue. The root of the tongue as a result of the contraction of stilolingual, paratlingual, and to some extent, the stilohyoid muscle is also pressed against the hard palate and the food lump enters the pharynx. The back movement of the lump is prevented by the palatal brackets, which are attracted to each other. Getting food into the nasal cavity is prevented by the fact that as a result of the lifting and tension of the soft palate, the connection with the nasal part of the pharynx is closed. At the same time, the upper one is shortened the muscle, is a constrictor of the pharynx, the passavan ridge, or in this case, joins the raised soft palate and closed the nasal pharyngeal space. Periodontal. The periodontium is a ligament that holds the tooth root in the tooth cell. Its fibers in the form of thick collagen bundles are woven into the cement <clears throat> at one end and into the cellular process with the other, creating several groups. Between the bundles of fibers, there are spaces filled with loose fibrous connective or inter stitial tissue containing blood vessels and nerve fibers. Epithelial remnants or aisles of mollusk are also located here. Functions of the periodontium. First there is the supporting, retaining and cushioning. Retention of the tooth in the dental cell, uh, distribution of the chewing food on the fibers of the main substance and the fluid associated with them. Participation in teething. Proprioceptive, due to the presence of the numerous sensory nerve endings, mechanoreceptors that perceive the load contribute to the regulation of chewing forces. The trophic function. It provides nutrition and vitality of the cement, particularly through additional channels to the tooth bulk. Reparative function takes part in restorative processes through the formation of cement, both in case of a fracture of the tooth root and during resorption of its surface layers. And the latest is the protective function provided by macrophages and leucocytes. Macroscopic structure of the tooth. The tooth consists of crown, we call it corona dentis, and a root, radix dentis. The border between the crown and the root is the neck of the tooth, of the tooth its cervix. The lower part of the root is the apex, its apex dentis. The main mass of the hard tissues of the tooth is dentin, which is covered with enamel within the crown and with root cement in the root area. The hard tissues of the tooth limit the pulp chamber, which contains the pulp. Crown and root pulp are distinguished. So, on this picture, you can see the anatomic root, uh, the apical foramen, root canal, cementum, 
uh, Dintin, Cemento, Dintinel Junction, and Paul Chamber. Uh, and the anatomic room uh, in this side, you can see the enamel, Dintinel enamel junction, lingual surface of the crown, and that's the enamel junction. There are incisors, dentists, incisivi, canines, dentals, canini, premolars or small angular teeth or dentist premolars and molars or large angular teeth. Incisors and canines belong to the front teeth, premolars and molars to the lateral ones. There are different surfaces of the teeth. Uh, on the picture you can see the basal, distal, lingual, labial, mesial, labial line angle, in CO cervical dimension, yeah? distal lingual line angle and distal labial line angle. Vestibul uh, so the first surface is vestibularis. It's uh, directed to the parietal lobe of the oral cavity. Uh, labialis, directed to the lip. Vocalis, directed to the cheek. Facialis, directed towards the face. Oralis, directed to the oral cavity itself. Lingualis, directed to the tongue only for the lower jaw. So it's not uh, correct to say that uh, there is a lingual surface uh, which is uh, located on the tooth of the upper jaw. So if you, if you say lingualis, uh, it means only for the lower jaw. Palatinalis, directed to the palate, it is only for the upper jaw. Medialis in the dental arch directed to the midline. Distalis in the dental arch directed from the midline. Uh, medialis, uh, also you could hear the word mesialis. So mesialis and medialis are the same. Approximalis located between the crowns of adjacent teeth. Incisionalis located on the cutting edge. Oculusalis, located on the chewing surface. And the latest cervicalis it is located in the area of the neck of the tooth. Signs of group membership of a tooth. Uh, crown angle sign. The angle between the incisal edge chewing surface and the medial surface is sharper compared to the angle between the incisal edge and the distal surface of the crown. A sign of crown curvature is characterized by a steep curvature of the vestibular surface near the medial edge and a gentle slope of this surface to the distal edge. A sign of the position of the root is characterized by a deviation of the root distally related to the longitudinal axis of the crown of the tooth, visible only on tooth removed from the jaw. Okay, we will talk about central apple incisor. The largest of the entire group has a shovel shaped crown. The unbaited hit cutting edge has three tubercles that continue along the vestibular surface in the form of very noticeable ridges. The lingual surface of the crown is concave in the longitudinal direction. Along its edge, there are two longitudinal ridges that gradually thicken the, th uh, the neck and uh, merge into a tubercle. On the contact surface, the crown has the shape of a wedge, narrowing to the cutting edge. A well-defined sign of curvature of the crown, a noticeable sign of the position of the root. The cavity of the tooth corresponds to its external contours, its longitudinal axis, is located closer to the vestibular surface of the crown. The lumen of the root canal is relatively wide and straight. The lateral upper incisor, smaller than the central one, the shape varies. The ridges on the vestibular surface are weakly expressed, but on the palatal surface they are clearly defined as a dental tubercle. In front of the tubercle, a blind pit is visible. The concavity of the palatal surface is more pronounced than that of the central incisor. 
The distal surface of the crown often has the appearance of rounding that passes into the cutting edge. The lateral incisor has well-defined signs of the angle and curvature of the crown. The cavity of the tooth is small, its configuration resembles its crown. The root handle is wide enough. Lower central incisor is the smallest of the whole group. It has a chisel-like shape. The usual signs of the belonging of the tooth are absent. The tooth tubercle is weakly expressed. The lingual surface has a slightly concave relief. The cavity of the tooth in the frontal plane has the form of a triangular gap. Lateral lower incisor. It differs little from the central one, but it is larger. The distal edge is longer. Signs of the teeth are better traced than in the central incisor. The cavity is the same, and the channel sometimes bifurcates in its middle part. At the same time, one part of it is located closer to the vestibular surface of the root, and the other to the lingual surface. On the picture, you could see uh, facial views of the right mandibular lateral incisor and the right mandibular central incisor, and differences between them. The upper canine. It has a spear-shaped crown. There is a thickening of it in the form of one well-defined ridge on the vestibular surface. Both contact surfaces gradually converge to the cutting edge. The cutting edge consists of two slopes that converge at an angle and form a gaping tubercle located closer to the mesial surface. The mesial surface is higher than the distal one and the mesial slope of the upper tubercle is shorter than the distal slope. On the lingual surface, there are two recesses between three ridges ranging from the dental tubercle. The cavity of the tooth begins with a cone-shaped protrusion that extends from the center of the crown to the neck, and then gradually passes into the root canal, which narrows. Canines have the longest root. The lower canine. Smaller than the upper, it resembles the upper lateral incisor in shape, although its cutting edge and vestibular surface are similar to those of the upper canine. The cavity of the tooth corresponds to the cavity of the upper canine, but the root cavity is more compressed in the mesial distal direction. Sometimes it is bifurcated. First upper premolar. Its vestibular surface resembles a canine of the opposite tooth row. It has the opposite sign of crown curvature. The slope of the vestibular surface in the mesial direction is more general than in the distal direction. The lingual surface is more convex and has a smaller size. The chewing surface is oval, divided by a transverse furrow or fissure into buccal and palatal tubercles. The palatine tubercle is smaller than the buccal tubercle. The root is more often bifurcated. The sign of the angle of the crown is pronounced. So here you can see the buccal ridge, crest of curvature, distal contact, and mesial contact of first upper premolar. Second upper premolar. It has a smaller crown oval in diameter. The root is usually single, cone-shaped. Signs of the surface of the tooth are well expressed. The cavity of the tooth is funnel-shaped, compressed in the mesial distal direction. Here you can see the transverse ridge, uh, which have triangular ridges. The, uh, the central groove, mesial mesial ridge, and mesial fossa. The first lower premolar. It has a rounded crown. The buccal tubercle is larger than the lingual tubercle. The vestibular surface is convex, inclined orally. The transverse interdental groove is divided by the interdental ridge into two pits. The roller forms two areas of the chewing surface. 
pronounced signs of curvature and angle of the crown. The cavity of the tooth is slightly compressed in the mesial distal direction. The root canal is one, it can be bifurcated. Second lower premolar. It has a sporical crown. The predominance of the buccal tubercle is less pronounced than that of the first premolar. Bits on the chewing surface can merge into a horseshoe shaped groove. Signs of the surface of the tooth are clearly expressed. <laughs> the root is longer and larger than that of the first premolar. The cavity of the tooth has two protrusions corresponding to the cusps. First upper molar. It has a massive diamond-shaped crown with the largest diagonal form uh, from the buccal mesial to the alto distal tubercle. Three furrows are shaped. The chewing surface is divided into four tubercles. Sometimes another abnormal tubercle, which is called the tubercle of carabelli or enamel drop, is formed on the palatal surface of the crown in the area of the palatal medial tubercle. The second upper molar. It resembles that uh, the carabelli tubercle in shape and presence of the first molar, which is slightly smaller in size. Options with three chewing tubercles are possible. The first upper molar is marked on the left and the second upper molar on the right side. First lower molar. It has a cubic shape with five stigatory tubercles. Two of them are vestibular and two are lingual, and one is distal. The medial tubercles are larger than the others, and the distal tubercle is the smallest. The medial root is longer than the distal one. The cavity of the tooth is wide, its bottom passes through into three root canals, two of which are located in the mesial root and one in the distal one. The second lower molar. It has cubic shape smaller than the first. The chewing surface is cross-shaped with grooves that demarcate four chewing tubercles. Clearly expressed signs of the surface of the tooth. Conventional designations are accepted in dentistry for each tooth, and the main conditions of the teeth, which greatly facilitates record keeping. The dental rows are divided into four quadrants. Which, uh, each of which is assigned a serial number that corresponds to the sequence of the examination from 1 to 4 for a permanent bite and from 5 to 8 for a temporary bite. The designation of each tooth consists of two numbers. The first number means the quadrant in which the tooth is located and the second is the conventional number of the tooth. Thus, the upper right central permanent incisor is designated as tooth 1, 1. The lower left second permanent molar is designated as tooth 3, 7. And the lower left second temporary molar is designated as tooth 7, 5. Here you can see the American tooth designation system, or it's called a universal numbering uh, system. Dental arches. Uh, the dental arch. Uh, in our dentition, we have three arches. First one is the dental arch, the second is the alveolar arch, and the third is the basal arch. The dental arch is a line drawn through the vestibular edges of the optical surfaces and the incisal edges of the crumbs. Alveolar arch, a line drawn along the ridge of the alveolar processes. Uh, it is marked with a number two. You could see uh, that it's uh, not as wide as the dental arch, and the smallest from them is the basal arch. Basal arch is a line drawn through the tops of the roots. 
sagittal occlusal curve, or it's uh, called curves of Speer. That's through the tops of the cusps of the teeth of the lower jaw. The deepest point is on the first molar. And transverse occlusal curve, or it's called Wilson's curve. It passes through the tops of the tubercles of the lower jaw in the transverse direction. Here on the picture A you can see the Speer curve and on the picture B a Wilson curve. By it is the relationship between the rows of the teeth in the central state occlusion. Central occlusion is the closure of the dental rows in which case the teeth have the maximum number of contact points and the articular heads of the lower jaw are allocated with the help of a disc at the base of the slope of the articular tubercles. Physiological bites uh, include orthognathia, direct bite, physiological prognathia, and physiological opistognathia. And pathological bites include pathological upper prognathia or distal bite, lower prognathia or progenia, and it's called a medial bite, deep bite, open bite, and cross bite. Orthognotic bite. The upper dental arch has an elliptical shape, the lower one has a parabola shape. On the upper jaw, the dental arch is larger than the cellular one, and the cellular one is larger than the basal one. Each of the teeth usually closes with two antagonists, one of which is called the main one, and the second one is called an additional one. With the expectation, of the upper wisdom teeth and the lower cell incisors, which have one antagonist. The teeth of each tooth row adjacent to each other touch each other with contact points located on the proximal surfaces. The height of the dental crowns gradually decreases from the central incisors to the molars. Canines are an exception. The upper front teeth overlap like scissors, the lower teeth by about one third of the crown, from 1.5 to 3 millimeters. The median lines between the upper and the lower central sizes are in the same sagittal plane. The buccal cusps of the upper teeth are located outwards from the cusps of the lower teeth, and the buccal cusps of the lower teeth are inwards from the cusps of the upper teeth. So, the upper palatal cusps fall into the upper fissures of the lower teeth and the lower buccal cusps fall into the cusps of the upper teeth. The lingual cusps of the lower teeth are located inwards from the palatal cusps of the upper teeth. The external buccal and internal tubercles of both the upper and lower chewing teeth are located at different levels on both sides of the jaws. The frontal section of the jaws through the chewing teeth, which goes from right to left, around the opposite direction is a transverse curve, convex on the upper teeth and concave on the lower ones. The anterior buccal tubercle of the first upper molar is located on the buccal side of the first lower molar in the transverse groove between the buccal tubercles and the posterior buccal tubercle of the upper first molar is located between the distal buccal tubercle of the first lower molar and the medial buccal tubercle of the second lower molar. Uh, to right bite. Right bite differs from orthognatic in that the cardiac edges of the upper teeth do not overlap, but fall directly like forces on the cardiac edges of the lower teeth. In the area of the lateral teeth, the relationship between the teeth is the same as in the orthognatic bite. As a result, in the presence of a direct bite, sometimes faster wear of teeth occurs than in the case of an orthognatic one. Under such conditions, the surfaces of the teeth are polished, the latter are resistant to caries, are firmly held in the cells, and are affected by periodontitis or periodontitis, less often than in other forms of physiological bite. Prognathia. Prognathia is characterized by a protruding position of the upper jaw. 
as a result of the distal shift of the lower jaw or the forward movement of the upper jaw, there is a violation of the closure of both the front and lateral teeth. In the case of prognathism, the teeth of the upper jaw are pushed forward and there is a gap between them and the lower teeth. Often, the lower teeth touch the mucous membrane, damaging it during closing the jaw. In the presence of prognathism, a violation of the proportions in the area of the molar teeth leads to the fact that the uh, anterior buccal tubercle of the first upper of the molar falls on the tubercles of the same name of the lower molar. And sometimes in the closing gap between the premolar and the buccal tubercle of the first lower molar. In the case of pronounced prognathia, the teeth of the upper jaw very much protrude forward, pushing out the upper lip for, from under which the cutting edge of the teeth are visible. Progeny. In the case of progeny creation of the dentition, the lower jaw is pushed forwards, as a result of which the lower front teeth overlap the upper ones of the same name. If the lower jaw protrudes slightly, contact is maintained between the front teeth. Foot is pitting off with the front teeth in the case of similar jaw relationships. In the presence of a significant displacement of the lower jaws forward, a gap is formed between the teeth, mighty food within sizes becomes impossible and is transferred to the side teeth. Since there is a medial shift of the lower jaw, the anterior buccal tubercle of the upper first molar comes into contact with the posterior buccal tubercle of the lower molar of the same name, or enters the closing gap between the first and second molars. Deep bite. Deep bite is characterized by a significant overlapping of the frontal teeth of the upper jaw with the frontal teeth of the lower jaw in the absence of incisor cuspid contact. The cutting edges of the lower teeth can touch the neck of the upper teeth. Sometimes there is no contact and the teeth touch the gums, damaging them. Lateral sizes are closed as conditions of orthognatic bite. In the presence of a deep overlap anatomic variant of lutecognitic bite, the upper front teeth overlap the lower ones by more than one third of the height of their crowns, but the incisal bump contact is preserved. In the case of the deep bite, it is absent. Open bite. There is no closing of the front teeth and sometimes the premolars only the molars come into contact. At the same time, there are deep functional disorders. The lack of contact between the frontal teeth forces the patient bite of food with premolars or molars. Reduction of the useful chewing surface, occlusion field, also makes it difficult to chew food. And the tongue, which increases in size, takes a significant part in the grinding food. The patient's language is impaired as well as his appearance. Crossbite. A crossbite is understood as such ratio of teeth rows, for which the buccal tubercles of the lower lateral chewing teeth are located to the outside from the upper ones of the same name. The front teeth closely close correctly. This bite occurs as a result of the narrowing of the upper dental arch and can be unilateral or bilateral. Now a few words about uh, classification. Here is a generally accepted classification of bite animals. Edward and Will proposed a classification based on the mesodistal ratio of the tooth rows depending on the location of the first permanent molars. And we call the ratio of the first permanent molars of the upper and lower jaws as the key of occlusion believing that the first permanent wall on the upper jaw is a stable point. With the correct ratio of the first permanent molars, the frontal buccal tubercle of the upper first molar falls into the front groove between the buccal tubercles of the lower first molar during closing of the jaws. Class 1. Correct closing 
of first permanent molars and the presence of maxillofacial animals in the front part of the tooth rows. Class two, uh, violation of the closing of the lateral teeth due to the more distal contact of the first permanent molars on the lower jaw. There are two divisions of this class. The class two, division one, is the protrusion of the incisors of the upper jaw. Class two, division two, we see the protrusion of the incisors of the upper jaw. In this picture, we can see the class two, division one bite. Class three, the lower jaw is more mesial to the upper jaw. Includes cases when all teeth on the lower jaw at the moment of closure are more mesial. Examination of the patient. When providing orthopedic care, it is necessary to follow the generally accepted methods of examination of the patient in the clinic, which include uh, collection of general registration date, analysis, and objective examination. The analysis consists of the patient's complaints, the analysis of the given disease, uh, called this analysis morbi, and the analysis of life, analysis vita. Complaints of orthopedic patients usually boil down to poor or impossible chewing of food, aesthetic discomfort, it can be associated with animal displacement of teeth in the frontal area or changes in the color of the crown part. Patients can also focus on pain during biting, pain in the TMG. The medical card of a dental patient, it is a form uh, 043-0, is a document in which date about the patient's dental diseases are recorded in outpatient polyclinic institutions where dental services are provided, regardless of the type of ownership of the institution. In line six, complaints from the words of the patient or relatives and to the complaints that most accurately reflect the patient's condition in relation to the dental uh, disease. The analysis of the disease consists of data and the dates and possible causes of tooth loss. For what period of time the frequency of diseases, stomatitis, periodontitis, or caries of the oral cavity, <clears throat> when orthopedic treatment was first carried out, and what type of prosthetics. Life analysis consists of data on the place of birth and residence, home conditions in which the patient lives, data on the place of work and its conditions, the nature of nutrition, disease suffered in childhood, disease that family members have or are suffering from. Examination of the patient must always begin with a survey and review since these two methods mainly determine the direction of all subsequent research. External, here you can see the external examination of the patient and the examination of the face. Uh, usually the examination is carried out inconspicuously for the patient during the first visit and during the collection of analysis. Pay attention to the symmetry of the house of face, the height of its lower third, the protrusion of the chin, the line of closing the lips, the prominence of the chin and lazolabial folds, the position of the corners of the mouth. After the examination, the TMG muscles and the floor of the mouth are palpated, as you can see on this photo. Here you can see the palpation of the muscles. Examination of the oral cavity. Examination of the mouth begins with determining the degree of its opening. 
Limited opening of the mouth can be caused both by narrowing of the opening itself and by difficulty in the movements of the lower jaw, which may be associated with muscle or joint contraction. Difficult opening of the mouth indicates the presence of pathology in this area, which prevents manipulations related to orthopedic treatment. It is important to determine the degree of opening rules of teeth when opening the mouth. At the same time as studying the state of opening the mouth, attention is paid to the nature of the movements of the lower jaw, their smoothness, interruption, displacement of the lower jaw from the median line to the right or left. Then the condition of the mucous membrane of the oral cavity is studied. <clears throat> In particular, the condition of the gums, transitional fold, cheeks, tongue, hard and soft palate, pyrogos, lymphatic ring or lymphatic ring of the pharynx is examined in detail. Dental examination. Examination of the condition of the upper and lower jaw is carried out separately. Determine the shape of the arch, nature of the closure or part. Examination of the teeth is carried out in a certain order, starting from the upper jaw and successively examining each tooth, from the wisdom tooth on one side to the wisdom tooth on the other side. During the examination of each tooth, attention is paid to the following features. The position of the tooth in the dental arch, tooth shape, color state of hard tissues, tooth stability, ratio to extracellular and intracellular parts, the position of the tooth in relation to the occlusal surface of the dentition, and presence of seals in their condition. Uh, now I feel like talking about uh, cephalogram, which you could use in your practice. Uh, there are two types of cephalogram, is lateral cephalogram and frontal cephalogram. Use of cephalometric analysis. It is regularly used for diagnostic purposes to determine the origin of an incorrect bite. For example, it can be a skeletal bite or a dental bite. It allows the clinician to know exactly how much the patient deviates from the described norms. It is used to monitor changes that occur due to growth and treatment. Accurate assessment of the patient's response to treatment. To predict changes that may occur in the future for the patient after orthodontic treatment. Here you can see the cephalometric analysis in the lateral correction. Points. We use points. Uh, in our cephalograms to determine the analysis. First of this point is the nasion. Nasal point. Nasal is a seam between the frontal and nasal bones. The second point is the point center of cella turtica. The center of cella turtica is located when examining the profile image of the fossa. Orbital point. Orbital is the lowest point on the left infraorbital margin. Porion point. Uh, porion is the highest point on the upper surface of the soft tissues of the external auditory canal. Uh, how you could search this point? The porion uh, is near the upper edge of the fossa of the TNG. Point Pogonion. Pogonion is the most anterior point of the lower jaw along the midline. Point A. 
of subspinalia. Point A is the deepest point on the curved bony contour between the anterior nasal spine of A, A and S and the prostium. The prostium point is the lowest, most anterior point of the alveolar part of the premaxilla in the median plane between the upper centrum incisus. Point B or supramentalia. Point B is the deepest point on the lower jaw between the infradentalia OID and the pogonium. Infradentalia is the highest, most anterior point of the alveolar process of the lower jaw located between the central incisors. Gnatian point. The Gnatian point is a point on the chin that is determined by bisecting the angle formed by the fascial plane and the mandibular plane. Fascial plane, the line from nasion to pogonium. Mandibular plane, the line near the lower border of the lower jaw is tangent to the angle of the lower jaw and symphysis. Gonial point. The gonial point is a point formed at the intersection of the tangent to the back part of the branch of the lower jaw and its base. So, uh, rules analysis. Uh, the skeletal pattern in normal lateralis uh, is made from facial angle, angle of convexity, a B plane angle, mandibular plane angle, and Y axis angle. Relation of the denture to skeletal pattern consists of a occlusal plane, excellent relation of upper and lower incisors, excellent relation of mandibular incisors to mandibular plane, excellent relation of the lower incisors to the occlusal plane, and the protrusion of maxillary incisors. First angle is the facial angle. Facial angle is an internal inferior angle formed by the intersection of the Frankfurt horizontal plane and the in hook line. It expresses the degree of recession or protrusion of the chin. Average value is 87.8. Uh, if you got uh, 82, is class to malocclusion if uh, 90. Five it is a chain protrusion. The Frankfurt horizontal is drawn between porion and orbitale. Angle of convexity. Angle of convexity expresses the protrusion of the maxillary part of the face in relation to the entire profile. The angle is formed by the intersection of the line and A and A poc. Average value is zero. If you got minus 8.5, it's a concave profile. If you got plus 10, it's a convexity profile. A B plane angle allows you to assess the difficulty that the orthodontist may face when obtaining the correct incisal ratio and their satisfactory inclination. This is a measure of the ratio of the interior limit of the apical bases of the jaws to each other and to facial plane. The average value is minus 4.6. If you got zeros, will be a minimum, and if you got minus 9, it will be maximum. The mandibular plane angle measured between the frontal horizontal and the mandibular plane, tangential to the lower edge of the lower jaw. The average failure is 21.8, minimum is 17, maximum is 28. If you got a minimum, it will be a low angle, and if you got a maximum, it will be a patient with a high angle. Mandibular plane is made between gonion and gnatium. The Y axis. The Y axis is the line from the cella to the gnatium, which is used to express the downward and forward growth of the mandible. Average value is 59.4. 
regarding fifty three to the minimum. It means that the patient had a horizontal growth. If you got a sixty six, it's a vertical growth. The patient have a vertical growth of the lower jaw. Counterpopulosal plane. Counterpopulosal plane is a straight line that runs between the top of the cusp of the first molar and the point between the cutting edge of the incisors. In cases where the incisors are in pronounced supra or infraocclusion, premolars are used. The average value is plus 9.3. If you got plus 1.5, it means that a patient has a class 3 or a horizontal counterpopulosal plane. The patient has a plus 14, means that a patient has a class 2. It's called a steep opulosal plane. Excellent inclination of the upper and lower incisors, or it's called an interincisal angle. It expresses the angle between the incisors. It's called also procumbency. Lines are drawn through the axis of the incisors. The internal angle is matched. You can see that the average value is uh, 135.4. The minimum was 130. It means that the patient have a protruding position. Uh, if the patient has 150 and more, it means that a uh, patient has a retrusive position of the incisors. The excellent inclination of the lower incisor to mandibular plane. Inclination of lower incisors to mandibular plane. Since the average value is 90, then the level uh, is described as a positive number in excess of 90. And the lingual tip is described as negative. You could see that the average value uh, is 91.4, the minimum is uh, 81.5, maximum is 97. The explanation of the low incisor is also called the uh, IMPA, inclination. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, it's incisor mandibular plane angle. If you will uh, search the analysis of three, you could find them this uh, impact or incisor mandibular plane angle. Uh, excellent inclination of the lower incisors to the opposite plane. The ratio of the incisors to the function plane or the plane. Used to check and interpret the incisor mandibular plane and or IMP. Average value is 104.5, minimum is 93, the maximum is 110. And protrusion of maxillary incisors is the distance between the cutting edge of the central incisor of the upper jaw to the apoc line. It is measured in millimeters. The average value is plus 2.5 millimeters. The minimum value is minus 1 millimeter. And the maximum is plus 5 millimeters. So uh, that's all I want to say to you. So thank you.